as we reflect on this Africa Day, that we're doing so virtually is in itself a cause of constant anxiety for so many across the globe. The necessary response to a pandemic that has exposed, once again, the realities of inequality across the, the globe, and especially our continent. The long reach of our colonial past seems to haunt our lives, underscoring not only how bodies and the human are understood and valued, but too, exposing the terror of the mind, evidenced in the powerful and evocative rendition of the post-colonial reality of Tsetse's characters in a book, This Mournable Body. We are reminded of the colonial and imperial mapping and of the weight of these traces, rendering some lives invisible, others eviscerated, black bodies being seen as lives of lack and difference. It is particularly, particularly crushing as we read this book and see as well, on a daily basis, the cruel reminders of the disposability of black lives and the cycle of violence enacted on black bodies. That these cycles of violence and representations of inadequacies have a genealogy is made crystal clear, crystal clear where on page 33, Tsitsi comments, and I quote, the room is crammed with bits and pieces like a secondhand shop, Tonga, Cape Dutch, Pioneer, and Colonial Railway, end quote. In every possible sense, African novels are political, and even though they are important pedagogical tools, I admit that reading them is difficult for me. I am unable to pull myself away from the unfolding experiences as they echo mine in all sorts of ways. In so doing, I find that the relentless and visceral reminders of the costs of an oppressive and violent past do not sit safely between the covers of the book. They escape tearing sharply into my carefully navigated composure, pulling me up like the acrid smell of smelling salts. It is no different with Tsitsi's book, and I find myself catching my breath, stopping at a particular line on page 10, where she says, the brochures lied, there is no shine in your memory. In as much as this novel is set in Zimbabwe, a country I've never visited, these few words shook me deeply. It spoke to the experiences and relentless bewilderment of hundreds of people that I've worked with and interviewed through my work in the Western Cape on race-based forced removals with people who are understood, in South Africa at least, as colored. I have been unable to respond adequately to countless women in the local clothing and textile industries whose ambitions and childhood imaginations are rendered mute. Of men and women who live lives of precarity, teetering on the edges, unable to make sense of the shame and despair of being kicked out of their homes due to South Africa's Group Areas Act decades ago. I have nothing to offer when working with middle-aged adults whose lives were wrecked due to being imprisoned as, anti as due to anti-apartheid student activists in the 1980s, or to men and women crippled by decades-old demons that surface in the dark. Memory in this instance is fraught with pain and loss, inadequate protection and solace in the face of further challenges of daily life after a reverberating catastrophe. As Sitsi writes on page 61, and I quote, there's a dullness to your skin like a thin membrane enveloping despair. Every minute of each 24 hours taunts you with what you are reduced to. You do not have the courage for anything you want, end quote. Our work is cut out for us. Constitutions can only offer a measure of protection when it comes to dignity. It is powerless when someone's worth is summed up in a look, a label, or a dismissive gesture in a world cultivated by centuries of hierarchies of race and color. As this book indicates, when those of us do not understand the codes and we do not have access to the clubs, we are left as unwilling actors in a script not of our making. Constitutions appear woefully inadequate, a feeble foil in the face of unconscionable levels of violence against women and children and xenophobic attacks. As Tsitsi writes, you do not talk about how citizens dissented and how the ghastly crushing caste bodies into disused mine shafts 
and swept them into railway carriages like debris dropped like a whirlwind. Violence, as Tsitsi so powerfully illustrates, begets violence. Achi does more. The book gestures towards the necessary work of the creative and the imagination. It dares us to hold the past to account, but equally to continue the project of freedom and emancipation so that the legacy we bequeath is of our making. As a creative piece, this, cause, this book underscores my unshakable commitment to the creative project in asking those questions that unsettle us and seeking answers that put, that put being fully human at the core, laying the groundwork for approaches that are inventive, bold, and curious. As the late Nigerian African studies scholar, writer and, writer and poet, Harry Garuba summed up, the organizing metaphor for representations of Africa is the idea of difference, end quote. And this difference from the norm is taken to extremes. This Africa Day sounds a call to respond to the crises, the cries and the opportunities of the contemporary moment, focusing specifically on those fraught and complex notions of difference and ways of being. At every moment, challenging pervasive perspectives and reorganizing and rethinking Africa and who we are and who we are in order to arrive at a different set of representations and opportunities. Furthermore, this day allows for a call to each of us to intervene in practical and theoretical ways, and what this might mean for attendant questions of disciplinary knowledges, decoloniality, dignity, transformation, and justice for all. As Sitsi's book reminds us, this is overdue. Thank you.